Good evening, good evening, and welcome along to Robin Elliott tonight here on NVTV. On the show this evening, I'll be chatting to best-selling author Tony McCauley all about his new book, Kill the Devil. We'll have live music in the studio from guitar maestro David Brown Murray. I'll also be chatting to a TV chef Leslie Waters. She'll have some delicious recipes for us a little bit later on. And also TV gardener David Dominey will also be on the show this evening. But let's begin by talking about this year's Derry Jazz Festival. It's back between the 27th of April and the 1st of May, and I got all the details earlier on this week. Here's what happened. So it's that time of year again, time for the Derry Jazz Festival. Once again, it's going to be a busy year to find out about some of the big highlights. I'm pleased to say Andrea Campbell joins us on the line. Andrea, thank you for joining us. So I believe there's going to be something like 70,000 people coming to this year's uh, Derry Jazz Festival. Yep, it's the 22nd festival this year, Robin. Um, and we're expecting over 70,000 people to attend the festival over the five days. So week tomorrow, it all kicks off. So I'm advising everybody to get their, download their trail and get their itineraries worked out for the weekend. And of course, uh, there is loads going on. In fact, everywhere you turn in Derry, there's going to be music somewhere, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, there's over 400 musical performances over the five days. So, you know, that's a lot of music happening um, over, the, over the whole festival. And as you say, there's outdoor music. There's basically wherever there's a spare spot, and the city, there's going to be some type of music playing over the weekend. So, and there's all types of music covered. It's the City Dairy Jazz and Big Band Festival. But, you know, we've got our jazz hubs that cater for all the real true jazz enthusiasts. And then apart from that, it's a range of there's every type of music catered for. So, you know, some people say, oh, but I'm not into jazz music. I don't think I would like that. It would like that. It's everything. We've got ska music. We've got rock music, blues, everything covered in the festival. Now, we'll talk about uh, some of this year's highlights in just a second, but if people want to get involved in the events as well, there's workshops and everything taking place, isn't there? Yeah, and I mean, the, the thing about our festival is most, the majority of all the events is free, you know, and we have some fantastic workshops and, and the leaders continue through to next week as well. Um, you know, so there is, there's, there's a bit of everything. There's a bit of educational stuff um, for people to come and take part in as well. So let's take a look at uh, this year's highlights then. Who's coming to the Derry Jazz Festival this year? Well, we have all our favourites coming back. We've got the Jay Vases, we've got the Red Stripe Band, we have Luke Thomas and the Swing Cats who are joining us for the second year this year. Um, we've got a new brass band coming to the festival, Back Chat Brass. We find a lot of um, people are really under the Roman Jack, uh, brass bands now, you know, that really adds such a such another level to the festival for the outdoor, outdoor element. So um, we have loads, loads of all the old favourites and some new stuff as well. And of course, every year you do remember as well the legends of uh, the music scene in Derry because uh, you have things like uh, the Gay McIntyre stage, don't you? Yeah, I mean, that stage last year, sadly, after two Gay McIntyre, you know, from, from now onwards. So that's the stage that you know, something that Gay would have loved as well. It really promotes young and upcoming musicians on the Saturday and then the Sunday, it's sort of, you know, more established musicians. So we have that and we have our music and the uh, craft village as well outdoors. So uh, plenty happening. And even throughout uh, the rest of the year as well, Derry is a great uh, city for music. Every time I'm up there, there's always great entertainment in all the local bars. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing with Derry. Derry is synonymous with music. Um, you know, the music city, and it's as it not just the festival. Every every weekend, you know, you'll always go one day. Most, um, you know, pubs and restaurants and hotels, and you'll find live music on there. So it's sort of a showcase for what happens, you know, throughout the rest of the year in the city. Now, we're going to play some music from uh, Luke Thomas a little bit later on on the show, but I've got uh, something good from Miranda Rosenberg standing by, and again, she's somebody who'll be making a welcome return to this year's festival, isn't she? Oh, definitely. I mean, Miranda's been a part of the festival for a long time now. She's one of our festival favourites and a regular to the festival. So, and what a what a show, you know, she puts on. You're, you're guaranteed to have a great time you know at any one of her gigs well if people want to get some more information and indeed uh, book their tickets for this year's festival how do they do that 
well, we can go onto our website, citadairjazzfestival.com. Um, tickets, everything, travel information, anything you need to know, accommodation is all on our website. And we've also got our social media pages, our Facebook page and Instagram page. So you can check that out there. Well, Andrea, great to talk to you. The best of luck with uh, the festival. And we've got a live performance now from Miranda Rosenberg that we recorded in the Millennium Forum in Derry a few years back. So here is the fabulous Miranda Rosenberg. My next guest on the show this evening is a best-selling author. Usually we're reading stories about his life in Belfast and growing up, but he's done something a little bit different now. His new book is called Kill the Devil, and I'm pleased to say Tony McCauley joins us in this studio. Tony, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Robin. Good to see you again, yes. and um, this time a little bit different from Paperboy and Bread Boy and all the rest of your books, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, it's a complete departure for me. As you can see, I'm wearing it an African shirt from my friends in Uganda, especially for the occasion. But yes, this is a, this is a book that I wrote after I'd been to Rwanda 
uh, over a period of time and uh, I met a young Rwandan screenwriter and we had this idea about could we collaborate mm -hmm. on something is it, have we is there some story we would like to tell together and um, I, I had spent time in Rwanda seeing reconciliation projects which were basically storytelling workshops between perpetrators and survivors of the the genocide mm -hmm. against the Tutsis in 1994 um, where a million people died in a hundred days yeah. Um, but what has happened in Rwanda is just incredible um, in terms of the reconciliation process. And at these storytelling workshops, I heard people tell their stories of a survivor, you know, saying how they had forgiven the man who killed her husband yeah. and her children and a perpetrator of genocide explaining how after he w faced justice and went to prison, when he came out, he sought forgiveness, confessed to, this, to the, the survivor and how they they somehow had been reconciled together. So when I was seeing all, all this in, in, in Rwanda, it was blowing my mind. And when I met uh, Juven Sabimana, the uh, young Rwandan screenwriter, I said, that's the kind of story I would love to tell. Yeah. That's the kind of story I would love to collaborate with you on. And at that stage, Juven said, he didn't have a laptop or a computer. He didn't even have a phone at that stage. And, uh, but what he did, when I, when I returned to Northern Ireland, he walked for four miles every day to the U.S. Embassy in Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, where students are allowed one hour free usage of a computer and internet right. a day. Yeah. Wow. And he researched and he developed and he ultimately wrote the synopsis. And he sent it, about a month later he sent to me and I read this synopsis of what ultimately became Kill the Devil and I, I loved it. Yeah. So basically after that then, I. I had just got a new laptop. I posted him my old MacBook. Right, yeah. And he, he started working on the full screenplay. Right. And then when he had finished the screenplay, he sent it back to me, and then I started to novelize it. So I took each scene and turned it into a chapter. Right. And we created other characters and locations. We, you know, we developed it as we went along together. But basically, a scene he had written, I turned it into a chapter. I emailed it or WhatsApped it to him. Yeah. He edited it and sent it back to me, and we were back and forward basically for four years. Wow. Until we ended up with the book. <laughs> so essentially it's a love story, isn't it? It is. It, it's a love story um, between a Tutsi woman who has survived the genocide and a Hutu man who was involved in the genocide. And, um, you, you know, we meet them both at the start of the book, and uh, they had been friends. They had grown up together, actually. But at the start of the book, Patricia, who's the main character, um, she's really, it's 10 years after the genocide and she has almost given up hope. Uh, she's lost everybody, she's lost everything. She doesn't feel life is worth living anymore yeah. and she's at a very low point in her life. Meanwhile, Damascene, who, who's the man, he, um, he's in hiding in Kigali. He's been in hiding for 10 years because he doesn't want to be brought to justice for the crimes that he committed in 1994. So they, you know, they start off apart, and then as the story yeah. develops, then I don't want to give it all away, but they eventually they connect again, and that's really what, and, and we follow them both on their journey. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the release of this book as well it ties in nicely to the whole Good Friday Agreement stuff that's going on at the minute as well, doesn't it? It does because it's the twenty fifth anniversary of our peace agreement in Northern Ireland. It's actually around the same time, the 29th anniversary of the genocide yeah. in Rwanda. And I suppose what, what's important to me is that in Rwanda, after much worse, they have achieved much more in terms of reconciliation. So can we learn a lot then from Rwanda? Exactly, we have so much to learn. So they have, for example, last week they had a day of remembering. It's an official day where everybody in the country uh, remembers and they have a very simple ceremony and they light candles and they just remember everybody who lost their lives and uh, like to me that's a simple thing we could do here that's not contentious politically just to remember everyone who lost their lives as a way of saying never again we yeah. don't ever want to go back there so they, they have things like that then they've also you know more difficult things like you know truth-telling processes you know, they had, they had their own process in Rwanda using the old traditional community court system that yeah, they yeah. had in the villages. Um, and that was very successful for, for them in terms of dealing with the past and people getting the truth and feeling they got justice. Um, and, um, you know, and, you know, South Africa had their version of that. Other countries have had their versions, 
We've had nothing after 25 years. So and are there things that we can now do that you've seen in Rwanda that we could do here in Northern Ireland that would actually work? I think we could do our version of them. Yeah. We wouldn't do that exactly the same, but we would use our culture. I mean, we do have a strong storytelling yeah. culture here. Yeah. So we could use that as a way of creating safe spaces for people to tell their story, for people to, um, for people to tell the truth, for people to get the truth who need the truth. Mm -hmm. and, um, and just to help with just people to feel heard which helps with the healing process. Yeah. The remarkable thing about Rwanda is that when you're, when you're there and, and you experience these workshops and you meet people, you do sense the brokenness that has been there, yeah. but you also sense the healing. Yes, yeah. Whereas it seems to me, we're still broken yeah. on the whole. Yeah. And that's why we're stuck. And yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's still unstable. And if we, don't, if we don't here find some way of dealing with the past and, and really getting to grips with reconciliation will continue to be unstable yeah. in the for, for the foreseeable future, whether the future is within the United Kingdom or in the United Ireland, whatever the political future yeah. is, this place will be unstable if we don't have reconciliation. So I, I think Rwanda, after, exp after experiencing one of the most horrible things in human history, they actually have something to share with the rest of the world. Yeah. And I think they really could help us. So. Um, so as well as my uh, co-author Ju Juvens, I work closely with a, a, a charity in Rwanda and Christopher Mboniagabu, he's actually coming here in, he spoke at the, the book launch yes, and, of course, yeah. and he, he's coming here uh, with me in June. In fact, we're both going to the States in... in I was just going to say, yeah, but I believe you're launching in America as yeah, well, which is, is big stuff. Yeah, isn't it? so we're launching in, in New York City in June right. and Christoph is going to come over to, with me and we're going to talk about reconciliation in Rwanda um, uh, while, while we're there. And then in July, uh, I'm, go, I'm going to Africa for the 12th fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we'll be launching in, in, in Kigali, the capital yeah. city of Rwanda, I think it's the 14th of July, and then um, going to Nairobi where my co-author lives and we're going to do a launch there. Yeah. And then we're going to Uganda and we'll, we'll do a launch in Uganda as well because there are a lot of refugees from uh, Rwanda live in, in Kampala. And would you love to see this turned into a movie? Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's, the, that's our dream. And that's, yeah. I mean, that is how Ju Juvens originally wrote it. And I think uh, it's interesting. Someone said to me the other day, I'm reading, I'm reading this new book. It's not like your others. It's very cinematic. <laughs> but I took that as a compliment. Yes. Yeah. But it, it is, it is, you know, it is that kind of story. Um, it, it, it was written for the screen, yeah. so that, that's our dream. Uh, and certainly in terms of uh, Juvens, my co-author, if that was to happen, that would certainly transform his life. Definitely, yes. Uh, yeah. That would be a wonderful thing if it happened. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. sounds amazing. You're going to read an extract for us in just a second, but in the meantime, where can we get the book from? Uh, as they say, it's available in paperback and e-book on all good bookstores. Mm -hmm. All right, so make sure you get your copy of Kill the Devil. In the meantime, thank you, Tony, for joining us. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. So here he is with an extract from that book, Kill the Devil. Here is Tony McCauley. All she wanted was peace. No more pain. No more hatred. An end to the despair ripping her heart apart. As she gazed across the vastness of Lake Kivu, her long white robe fluttered in the breeze, framing her elegance. The beauty of her face contradicted the harshness of her shaven head. Alone on the shore in the darkness, she was like a tiny light teetering on the edge of eternity. She noticed the beauty of the soft moonlight glistening on the tranquil black waters. As the gentle lap of waves caressed her feet, she welcomed the stillness of the night. She knew what she wanted. She had always known. Tonight she wanted solitude and silence to be forever. She remembered standing on this very spot, watching her father cast nets for fish. Her mouth watered at the memory of the delicious tilapia he caught and cooked on the shore. Many years ago, she sat here feasting on fish with her father, mother and older sister, laughing at her baby brother, throwing fish bones to the otters. She inhaled deeply and imagined the smell of fish cooking on the fire. For a moment, her girlish sense of wonder returned as she noticed the lanterns of hundreds of fishermen twinkling across the expanse. 
like stars in a moonless sky. The distant sound of rhythmic singing, whistling and paddling seemed closer now, suggesting the nightly toil of the fishermen was at an end. Lost in reflection, she had no sense of time passing until she began to notice the sensation of cold, wet sand between her toes. Suddenly, she was startled by a rumble of thunder. She looked up and the moon was gone, concealed by clouds. Soon beyond the shadows of the little island nearest the shore, she spied the elegant silhouettes of three-haul fishing boats with long eucalyptus rods attached to their bows and sterns. The fishermen were returning and time was running out. Roused from her trance, she looked around the deserted shoreline. A smile flickered across her face as she recalled walking barefoot on the silt with Bernard. She ached for that perfect family day with a picnic on the shore and little Alice asking questions about the baby growing in her tummy. All joy was gone now, but this remained her place of peace. Suddenly, a flash of light in the sky illuminated the great mountain and volcanoes on the horizon. Now she understood the swift return to shore. She could hear the approaching fishermen singing traditional songs of courage in Amashi as they fled the threatening thunderstorm. Alert now, the anguish of loneliness returned. She closed her eyes and tried to dismiss any doubts that might divert her from this chosen path. She was determined in her belief that there was no love in her world. In one hand, she held a bottle containing her handwritten, tear-stained goodbye. Perhaps one day someone would find it and remember her. When she opened her eyes for a final look at the moon and the stars, they remained cloaked by dark clouds. A single thin tear trickled down her soft cheek. One last time, she asked God to embrace her. After 10 years of praying for answers, she feared God was not listening. God was not there in 1994. Perhaps God had never been there. Raindrops began to dimple the water and spit on her face. Eyes wide open, she steadily walked forward into the cold, dark water, releasing the bottle from her hand and letting go of everything. All she wanted was an end to desolation. No more grief. No more anger. She was seeking rest and peace in the dark waters of Lake Kivu. But a storm was beginning to rage. OK, let's meet my next guest on the show this evening. We're talking uh, food now, and it's always good to catch up with uh, TV chef Leslie Waters. And according to some new research, 14% of UK adults eat seafood once a week, despite the fact that eating salmon's high-quality protein builds and maintains lean body mass, regulates metabolism and builds stronger muscles, which results in greater mobility, strength and dexterity. Leslie joins us now to talk about a dish with uh, the cost of living in mind and to tell us that their uh, frozen fish is a high quality product at a cheaper price and essential to more than half of us who think quality is important when purchasing an item such as salmon let's talk to leslie now she joins us on the line how are you today i'm fine robin really nice to see you Good to see you. So I'm excited to hear about these uh, fabulous recipes, especially the wild Alaskan salmon one. Tell us all about that. Well, if, do you like a pie, Robin? I do, actually, yes. I've got all my family descending on me tomorrow, and it's such a simple pie to make. You need short crust pastry, whether or not you make it yourself, that's up to you, or buy it. Roll it out into a really big round, like one of those chef plates, really big. Put it on some baking parchment on a baking tray. Preheat your oven to 100 degrees Celsius. Fry yourself off a couple of big onions in olive oil until they're really golden. That'll take about eight minutes. And open yourself a can of wild Alaska red salmon and drain it gently. And then 
take yourself some cooked potatoes, whether or not they're leftover potatoes, slice them, and then put the onions on the pastry, leaving a border, spread them out a bit, top it with the sliced potatoes, grate over some strong cheddar cheese, really mature cheddar cheese over the top, fold in the edges of your pastry so you make a little edge, and then brush them with beaten egg. Stick the pie in the oven, and then take your beautiful wild Alaskan salmon and combine it with chopped spring onions, beautiful bright green watercress, a lovely orange and mustard vinaigrette and toss that through. Cook your pie for about 20 to 25 minutes until it's bubbling and golden brown. Take it out, put it onto a chopping board, slide it on the board and top it with the Alaskan salmon and watercress salad. Take it to the table with a little pot of sour cream and garlic and black pepper and enjoy. It is so delicious. Sounds absolutely amazing. It's yeah. just so easy. So are people still sticking to the tradition of eating fish on a Friday then? Yeah, I think they are. And and most Fridays you talk to people, they have fish. I mean, it dates back to obviously Christianity and um, it's been something that's been around since medieval times, you know. Um, and most people eat, will eat, the percentage of people will eat fish once a week. But I think more and more people are eating more and more fish. And I think when I grew up, I grew up, I love canned, wild canned salmon. I love it. And my mum used to make amazing things with it, especially um, mustard and cress brown bread salmon sandwiches, which were to die for. And I still make them. They're still my favourite sandwich. Um and it's just so cost effective. I mean, when I grew up, you know, I came from a working class family. We didn't have a lot of money, but salmon sandwiches were posh. They were for posh teas. And um, I, I absolutely love them. I've always got wild Alaskan salmon in my cupboard. Um, I love it because it's so versatile. It's just as nutritious as fresh fish. Um, and, you know, it's full of lean protein. It's a great um, thing to eat and it's really versatile. And because it's in your cupboard, it's not going to go off and you're not going to have any waste. So for a lot of people these days, I mean, more than half of us are planning to cook for our families and friends at home celebrating over Easter because money and the cost of living. So to be able to create dishes like this and for them to be easy for people to make. I think that's really, really important. And of course, for something like salmon, there are many health benefits from it too, aren't there? Yeah, it's a very, very healthy thing to eat, especially if it is uh, wild, natural and sustainable. Um, it's full of lean protein. It's got omega-3s and 6 fatty acids. And if you eat the bones, which are really soft, I mean, it's not everyone's thing, but I do eat the bones. They're full of calcium, vitamin D and B. So it's a great source of food. And when it comes to food such as salmon, do you think people care where their food comes from these days? I do. I think people care pretty much about where most of their food comes from. And I think they want to they want to feel good about their food, but they also are cutting costs you know, and by using something like wild Alaskan salmon, you know, it's not as expensive and incredibly versatile. And it's something that you can keep in your cupboard. You haven't even got to freeze it. You know, you can keep in your cupboard um, and it's a really great thing. But I do think, but I do think there are a lot of cookery programs out there and some of them are fantastic. I mean, I don't know if you've seen Jamie Oliver's show when he does his one pot. I mean, he's just great, you know, um, I want to be him when I grow up. I mean, you know, he really is super. Um, but I think there's a lot of stuff out there that is very complicated. And I think it can put people off of cooking. They yeah. think, oh, you know, what's the point? You know, well, actually, there is a massive point, you know, um, to be able to put something together really easy. That's what I'm into as a teacher. I want people to cook, not just posh food for a dinner party once a week, but good food every day. Now, is frozen salmon as good as fresh salmon? Yeah, I think it is, actually. I think canned salmon, wild salmon, frozen wild salmon and fresh wild salmon is, you know, they're all pretty much equally the same. Yeah. Um, the beauty of having something in a can is the fact that it's in your cupboard. And what about some tips then for people who want to make a nice fish dish and maybe want to try something a little bit different then? 
I would say go to the website, which I'm going to tell you about in a moment, because my recipes will be on there. And so, too, will be all the wild Alaskan recipes and ideas. It's a fab website. Keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate it. You know, also get everyone to help. Yeah. Get everyone in the kitchen, get everyone to help. Make it a social thing. Um, and then everybody will get something out of it. And of course, if you are planning a big family get together, it can be really stressful, can't it? Well, yeah, they can. But I think that's that whole thing. Get everyone involved. And, you know, I remember my mum years ago, she'd lock herself away in the kitchen and come out looking really sweaty and hot and produce this food. Wouldn't let anyone in. You know, we've got big, you know, we've got slightly bigger kitchens these days. And, you know, um, it's just wonderful to get everyone involved in helping. And, and you know, the stress factor shouldn't be there. Have some fun with it. Well, if people want to check out the website with all those fabulous recipes, where can they go to to do that? www.wildalaskaseafood.co.uk I'm going to check it out myself. Leslie, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. OK, time for some live music in the NVTV studios. And my next guest releases his new album, Square One, at the American Bar on the 30th of April. So here performing live is David Brown-Murray.
fabulous song called uh, The Long Haul from David Brown Murray from his new album Square One and I'm pleased to say he joins us now in the studio. How are you sir? Warm. But it's very warm under here control, today, isn't it? otherwise, yeah. <laughs> but you're excited. You're getting ready for the big album launch on the 30th of April. Yes, yes. It's gone to print now, so the stress is sort of off the whole thing. Yeah. And the gig I have no nerves about. The Excellent. gig I'm very much looking forward to. So it's taking you quite a while to get this album out. I think it's 10 years since your previous one, isn't it? He, is Nigel giving you notes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something of a sort of 10 year long writer's block, coupled with just. Uh, just, I wasn't unhappy with the first one. It was just, I didn't know anything about production. I didn't know how these things were made. And my sort of target artist is a guy called Tommy Emmanuel, which is a sort of stupidly high standard to try and match. But you got to open for him at one stage, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, and that, that was sort of, the, the tide started to turn at that stage. Once he was happy enough to let me steal his crowd for 40 mm -hmm. minutes, then I thought, well, we should really we should really engineer a, a sort of second attempt. And then Nigel, my boss, built a recording studio. And there, there was the universe again saying, okay, maybe it's time to get this done. And it took a bit of doing, but I've had listens through now where, I don't know, the part of my brain that's always looking, for, analyzing for problems with it yeah. was quiet and I'm happy with it, so. And of course, the Nigel we're talking about is the legendary Nigel Martin, the who we've known for years. The man, the myth, yes, <laughs> who we've known for years, who, yeah. He doesn't make rubbish. He you doesn't, have to be good no. to work with Nigel. Enduring perseverance and persistence and commitment, I think, was the thank you in the, the album credit, and it is no word of a lie, for yeah. sure. So tell us about you then. Why was it the guitar? What, what got you started on the guitar then? Harmony, I guess, when I was very young. One note on its own never did it for me. What would colour that one note as to what it was arranged in with or stacked with? And that started off on little keyboards way before guitar, and then guitar came along. And then guitar just travels better. So when I was doing it in school, preferred to do guitar, and then went off to music college, and there's no bringing a keyboard with you, so. No, you went off to Boston as well, didn't you? I did, yes. Um, went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston for about two and a half years. I, I just say attended Berkeley College of Music. I don't mention the fact that I didn't actually graduate, so that's like, you're getting the inside scoop. Um, and yeah, the guitar, it's, you can do bass lines on it, drums on it, melodies on it. There's very few instruments I feel on earth can do like a valid evening's worth of entertainment yeah. just on their own. And guitar's the one, so. Who's the greatest guitar player for you in the world then? Tommy Emmanuel, hands yeah. down, yeah, no doubt. He's not everyone's favourite, and he's certainly not the most known to the general mm. public, but I feel like if you know your way around guitar, and you watch his show, and you, you, you feel what's going on there, as opposed to just mad technique or whatever, yeah, I don't think anyone's poured themselves into it quite as completely as he has, so he's and the guy. We've had the Ards uh, Guitar Festival running during the week as well. You had a big year there, didn't you, once? Young Musician of the Year, I think I was about 15, 14 or 15 or 16. And yeah, that was cool. That was my first sort of competition victory, I think. Not that I'm, I kind of weigh musicians that haven't done that, but it's, it's nice to sort of stick your hat in in front of judges and that yeah. different sort of pressure and come out on top and want a guitar out of it. So it was pretty yeah. cool. Excellent. So the, the new album, Square One, tell us about it. What can we expect from it? It's, it's, it's as good as it's, it's as good as I can manage. Um, it's ten originals. They they don't come quickly to me. Um, like people can like just bang out album after album, and I think that's I think that's class. But in the world of fingerstyle guitar, there's just so many little bits of good ideas that kind of never cemented the completed ideas. But I finally got ten together. And we wanted, Nigel and I wanted to do all originals this time. So there wasn't, we weren't relying on copyright this and yeah. royalties that. Like everything that's on it, I wrote and we made together. And it all, it all happened in, in Dock Street Studios in Belfast. It wasn't recorded elsewhere. And the notion behind it was just, you know, let's forget everything that I think I know and every bias that I have towards venues or my suitability towards certain crowds or whatever and just absolutely back to the what I used you know used yeah. to really really do it for me was just 
play a guitar on my own with no, no tricks and no overdubs and all that sort of stuff. And that's it, very much back to square one. Okay, this, you're gonna do the one theme. more live one for us this be time. Be what are you gonna to? do this time? I'll do the reins this time. Which I've heard it's already, the I've got a sneak yeah. preview of that. That's the one Nigel's been sort of sending out to people. Yeah. Brilliant yeah, stuff. Well, the best of luck with the gig. 30th of April, the American Bar. Is the Many album thanks. Launch. Thanks so much. Have a good one and uh, thanks for coming in. You're very kind. Thank you. So here we go, performing live one more time. Here is David Brown Murray. <laughs> Okay, time now for our weekly What's On guide, where we take a look and see what's happening throughout Belfast and beyond over the next week or so. We're starting off at the Empire here in Belfast uh, tomorrow evening, and uh, the supergroups of the 70s defined the decade in a way that's never been rivaled since. The Eagles, Led Zeppelin and Fleetwood Mac ruled the world with enormous budgets, enormous albums and enormous tours. They walked the earth like golden gods. So tomorrow night you can revisit that era with Mac Fleetwood, the world's premier tribute to the classic Lindsay Buckingham and Stevie Nicks days of Fleetwood Mac. And you can catch the guys at the Empire tomorrow evening. Now moving on to the 27th of April and Danny Larkin brings her Walking with Natives tour to the Dunkern Arts Centre. And Danny is an artist renowned for her unforgettable live performances, her magical songwriting and her vocal always taking centre stage accompanied by her impressive guitar and banjo playing. 
and that event is part of this year's Cathedral Quarter Arts Festival. And staying with this year's festival, Paul Brady is going to be back in town for his uh, Crazy Dreams book launch and that takes place on Friday the 28th of April at Rosemary Street Church. And Paul Brady will be in conversation with Ralph McLean talking about Crazy Dreams, a compelling and highly anticipated autobiography from a musician whose remarkable career has spanned six decades. Moving on to the 28th and 29th of April and uh, top comedian Terry McHugh will be on stage at the Mac Theatre and before he was a non-award winning comedian, before he was Jake O'Kane's opener and before he ever appeared on The Blame Game or in Game of Thrones, North Belfast comedian Terry McHugh was an international yo-yo champion travelling the world bringing joy to the masses with his yo-yo and he might even get the yo-yo out on stage at the Mac on the 28th and 29th of April. Now moving on to the world of dance and Wasteland is a show that takes you back to the 90s rave scene through exceptional dance archive film footage and a powerful rave soundtrack and unique artwork by Jimmy Cauty, the co-founder of the KLF and you can catch Wasteland at the Mac on the 27th and 28th of April. Now, a number of local businesses are coming together for a sustainable clothes market and a local business advisory firm BDONI has partnered with outdoor street food and retail market The Trade Market in aid of local charity Northern Ireland at Chest, Heart and Stroke to bring a pre-loved fashion market to the Linen Quarter here in Belfast. And the market, which takes place on Friday the 28th of April, has seen a number of local businesses signing up to take part, including East Belfast-based Vintage clothes shop American Madness who will donate some of their pre-loved denim to the market and organizers are encouraging people to use their spring clean to find their pre-loved quality designer fashion a new home and on the day a special auction of some standout pieces donated by local style icons and well-known faces will also take place and I'll be hosting that auction on Friday the 28th of April the event runs from 12 noon through until 6 p.m. and finally for now if you want to catch a movie in cinemas this weekend why not uh, check out the assassin club an assassin is given a contract to kill seven people around the world only to discover the targets are also assassins who have been hired to kill him as well here's a clip is in your job yeah i told you i'm out it's not that simple it's six separate contracts and each one pays a million dollars tell me about it they're assassins more good like you. Men like to come in. And each other. Fact is, Morgan, they were coming for you. Whether you accept it or not. OK, time to talk gardening now, and according to some new research, nearly one in three of us are actually growing our own fruit and vegetables. TV gardener David Dominey joins us now to offer some tips on gardening, regardless of your experience. He's going to talk about the nation's trend towards being self-sufficient and why getting out into the garden is the hobby to have this year. David joins us on the line. How are you today? Very good, thank you very much. There's something about the uh, the end of March going into April that makes, I don't know, the whole of the country come out to life. I think it's the daffodils and the flowers and the foliage, all of those things make us uh, feel, it uplifts the heart, it nourishes the soul. Well, good to see that you're enjoying being outside today. I would imagine it's pretty cold where you are at the minute, though. Well, I think that's where we enjoy the sun most, isn't it? When we had a, a cold winter and occasionally the sun bursts through and we feel the warmth on our face. So you can smell where somebody's cut the grass for the first time. And those little snippets mean all the more than in summer where we get it all the time. So I suppose it's, a, it's an appreciation, but it is a little windy today. Now, according to the latest research, uh, one in three of us are now growing our own fruit and vegetables. Is this because of uh, the shortages that we're seeing in the supermarkets and shops and things? Yes, well, there's a couple of reasons. You're quite right. Uh, miracle Grow uh, uh, put out a survey working out what people's attitudes are to growing your own. And uh, uh, as you quite rightly say, uh, 30, nearly 30% of them said that they're growing their own already. Another 35% say it's on the list to do. So uh, actively in, engaging in, in uh, growing your own 
at home, whether it's a container or whether it's into the ground, is becoming more and more popular. And David, if you haven't got a big garden, is it possible to adapt to do this then? Yeah, I mean, you can grow in any spaces. If it holds soil, you can grow. It's as simple as that. So whether, whether it's a saucer, a bit of damp tissue paper to grow cress, whether it's uh, uh, trailing strawberries or tomatoes in hanging baskets, um, you, you can grow more or less in anything. And probably the best one is miracle Grow do this, this veg planter. It's really like a super-sized grow bag. It's thicker and it's longer. I love those because I cut open the top and each of my kids have their own little grow your own area. But I've grown a whole herb garden in those things. And it's not just for tomatoes or peppers or, or chilies or even strawberries. Um, all you need is something to hold peat free compost and, and you're ready to grow. Planting in your borders, you know, next to your roses and delphiniums, a lot of the fruit can go into there. Or whether you've got a dedicated space to grow. I mean, for fact, you can grow potatoes in dustbins. You can buy. Uh, a cheap dustbin for them from the DIY or the uh, discount shack, drill a few holes in the bottom, uh, 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 put some uh, peat-free compost at the bottom, uh, and then plant them up, and they'll grow fat. If you've just got a, a bag, you just slip the bag of the compost in and put the potatoes in. Effectively, something that holds soil, add in water, let nature do the rest. So could we become a self-sufficient nation then? I'm thinking about things like uh, the old TV series, The Good Life. Is this something that could be possible? Why not? I see no reason why every household can't produce a significant amount of home produce, even if they just have a windowsill inside the house. You know what I mean? Change the kitchen windowsill. Take off that, uh, uh, that, that old souvenir Eiffel Tower, that picture of Aunt Edna and that ceramic poodle. Clear those off and then put on there basil and chives and, uh, and, uh, uh, and sage and parsley. You can grow a lot on your windowsill. And outside too, planting fruit bushes that just keep growing bigger and better, and even crops like rhubarb or asparagus. Once you've planted them, they produce their own crown and they just come up year in, year out, low maintenance. And I think it's like anything, it's eclectical. You know what I mean? You choose something, you get growing, and next year or later on, you choose another. And that's why it becomes, you know, the nation's greatest hobby. And you asked me a question earlier on, where are we seeing the uptake of people growing your own from that first miracle growth? survey saying 30% of us grow and 30% more want to grow. And I think it really started in lockdown, where our gardens were seen as something to, you know, to, to take our minds off the stresses and the anxiety that was happening at the time when we couldn't go out. We saw our gardens and we grew our own. And we reckon that nearly 3 million people picked up the trowel for the first time and existing gardeners were growing more. So we had that. But compounded on with uh, what's happening in the world and the cost of living crisis, people are looking to save money. This is a fantastic way to save money. But of course, on top of that, there's also the availability in uh, supermarkets of home produce. And there's also the plastic that goes with it. And nothing tastes better than something you pick yourself from what you've grown and you taste it. It's better flavour. It's better for you. And the whole emotional connection with producing for yourself and your family gives you an immense sense of well-being. So being self-sufficient empowers the house and the family. And uh, it, it just changes your life. Going out to see how things are growing puts a smile on your face. So mentally you're there. And then when you eat it physically, you're healthier too. Now, if you're a beginner like myself, what are the main pitfalls that we should be watching out for? Well, it's not, I, I suppose, if anything, it's a fear of getting started that's the pitfall. I'd start by sitting down while you're having a cup of tea, having a break or, or having, having, having a beer at the end of the day, whatever, whatever you tipple, just write down the things you like. I like peas. Um, oh, I really like strawberries. I love strawberries in the morning. Blueberries are quite, you know, and you make a list of the things you like. And that's your motivator. That initiates the, 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 the passion to go further. Um, then choose a spot where you want to grow it. Is it one of these miracle Grow veg planters out the front or is it a pot or is it a space in the garden? And then just plant one or two of the things that you have on that list and get growing, you know, and effectively you learn as you go along and that confidence builds and then you grow to more and more and more. Everybody, every one of us, because uh, it's hardwired into the, into the human nature. It's 12,000 years ago when we started growing our own rather than just scavenging and, 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 and hunting and gathering. You know, we, we grow, we eat. You choose something new, you have a go at potatoes, have a go at raspberries, and it becomes a hobby that, uh, 
that makes you feel good. Some great advice there. If people want some more info on anything we've talked about, where can they go to for that? If they go to the website lovethegarden.com, that's lovethegarden.com, it's a Miracle Grow website and there's loads of stuff on how you can grow your own on a budget. And David, are you coming back to see us in Belfast anytime soon? Yeah, I, I should be over in a few weeks' time. I'm coming over to, to, to give some talks over there and I'm looking forward to it. We look forward to that. Uh, David, good to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Lovely talking to you. So that's nearly all we've time for on the show this week. We started off by talking about this year's Derry Jazz Festival, which of course runs from the 27th of April until the 1st of May. So let's finish with an act who will be appearing at this year's festival. We're talking about uh, Luke Thomas and the Swing Cats. We'll see you back here same time next week. Bye-bye. Think it's suspicious. He's rapping, he's swinging now. I thought he was a pop singer, he should sit down. Mom's from Trinidad, move fast like Otto Bolden. Sit back, relax, watch my plan unfolding. Real deal, man, y'all just posing. I'ma win this race, man, y'all just strolling. Hold up, is that my microphone you're holding? Natural born talent, when I shoot, I'm scoring. I'm